All right, so we'll, we're gonna start the afternoon session uh, with our uh, one of our two plenary speakers. This is uh, Juliana Fair from NYU. Um, I'm, uh, if Shuche didn't introduce you, I'm uh, Phil Harris, I'm the deputy director of A3D3. Um, A3D3, we, we don't just make AI, we make AI run faster. Um, that's what we do. Um, anyway, so that's, that's my ad. Um, we'll start with the, this, Juliana's talk, and then we'll proceed and, and uh, have the research panel uh, where we'll talk about uh, various things. Uh, so let me pass the mic to Juliana, please go ahead. I think you can hear me, right? Okay, great. So I'm Juliana Freire, I'm a professor of computer science and data science at New York University. Um, I'm a computer scientist by training and a data scientist by choice. <laughs> and today I'll try to share with you some of my views uh, about data science. I was asked to talk about, if the clicker works, about research, data science and overview. So I thought I'll give a, a, some retrospective or my perspective of what, you know, how we got here. So in, you know, by now data science has been established as a scientific discipline. But when it started back, I don't know, maybe 2014, 15, we spent a lot of time discussing what data science is and what it isn't and what it entails, right? Um, but one thing at that point was clear is that data science was very important as all the sciences were becoming data driven, data intensive, and everybody was using computers to get you know, amazing results. We needed to make data science succeed. Right? So the big question and the big challenge here that we had in, uh, in front of us was, how can we create an environment um, that can, you know, um, where data science can flourish and the, where we can maximize the impact of data science, right? And this is uh, when we started this uh, Moore's Sloan data science environment which was uh, uh, an experiment uh, where I ha we had uh, NYU, UW, hi, Sarah, uh, and uh, Berkeley. Uh, and it was funded by the Moore and the Sloan Foundation exactly to try and figure out, sorry, uh, oops. Yeah, um, you know, how can we actually in academic environments, how can we foster data intensive discovery, how can we uh, create and sustain interdisciplinary collaborations, right? Uh, and the idea is that we'd like to do that to establish this virtuous cycle where advances in data science methodologies need lead to advances in domain uh, and discoveries in the domains. And also at the same time, stimulate additional advances in the actual methodologies, right? And together we identified a number of challenges you know, who are the people that should be working and doing data science at university? So we investigated um, what career paths should we offer uh, that will contribute to data science? You know, uh, who should we educate and how should that educate and train people on data science? What kinds of software tools and environments do we need to establish uh, to enable people to do data science? Uh, how can we actually add to this environment uh, best practices and tools that help people do reproducible work? Uh, we also looked at working space, you know, what uh, kinds of workspaces uh, are conducive to collaborative and interdisciplinary research. And we also did a number of, of uh, a lot of work on evaluating uh, the, you know, the different strategies we came up with as well as, you know, ethnographic studies, right? Uh, but this is history because nowadays, uh, Data science has exploded. It's no longer those three universities. We have a large number of data science initiatives and centers, and that I got from the academic data science uh, site, you know, the, the, the screenshot, and a number of, uh, of these centers and other centers that are actually represented here uh, in the audience, right? We made a lot of progress in terms of education. We are teaching data science at different levels graduate, undergraduate, uh, even for high school students, K to 12. Um, funding agencies have been, you know, really, uh, how can I say, uh, encouraging developments in the area. There are a number of funding um, 
programs at NSF, at NIH, and other uh, funding agencies that are focused on data science. And we can really see that this has had an impact. This has made a difference. And just you know, for fun, what I did um, uh, this week was I went to Google Scholar and I did simple searches like deep learning with physics, visualization and biology, right? Everything, you know, domain and computer science and data science. And you can find thousands of papers uh, that combine these techniques, right? So I think that this kind of like is one signal of the big success that data science has had, right? And in my own group, in my own center at, uh, uh, at NYU, we've actually over and over have observed data science filling this virtual cycle. Right, so we've done a lot of work on urban analytics, trying to answer questions in different domains like transportation, mobility, urban planning, and policy making. And by trying to answer those questions, we actually identified a number of very challenging and open problems in computer science and data science. Um, here's just you know some of the areas that we've been working on. For example, when we're doing large scale, and I think somebody was talking about large scale spatial temporal data analytics. We try to do that with data from New York City, very large data. There are no techniques, no systems that we've had that actually were able to handle the scale and the interactivity requirements to do data exploration uh, uh, with the, you know, that, that kind of urban, uh, in, in this kind of, for these urban questions. So that actually led a whole new area of work in our group and in computer science on how do you support interactive and very fast spatial temporal queries and analytics. And there are a number of other examples. So I list here just like a small subset of the papers that came out of this project. Uh, some of the areas we looked, visual analytics, machine learning, computational topology, data discovery, data cleaning. Many of these are actually funded by NSF and we produce not just papers, but open source systems that actually have been deployed and used by the domain scientists uh, that we and experts we've collaborated with. All right. So let's take a step back uh, and kind of like reflect a bit on uh, how we really got here. Right. So we got here because we had this perfect storm where computing was essentially three, storage is three, and we have tons and tons of data. Right? And very early, early on, when data science was starting, we uh, quickly realized that the bottleneck is really people. Right? We have computing, we have data, but to get insights uh, and to um, understand phenomena, we need uh, people. Right? And it's very hard for people to actually do that. They need to put together complex computational processes. They need to learn about many different topics data management, visualization, machine learning, statistics, right? It seems like an untenable uh, task to do, right? Uh, and this makes it really hard for domain experts that don't have training in computer and data science to actually explore their data. So many of the early efforts in data science had this focus on you know, democratizing data science, enabling domain experts to actually make use of the, you know, this great technology, computing data and uh, uh, data science tools, right? And again, we made quite a bit of progress through the development of uh, open source software, right? There's a, huge and very rich um, uh, ecosystem of open source tools, Jupyter and you know, so on and so forth. We have you know, cloud infrastructure, we have very easily accessible computing. Uh, we also have uh, developed a number of uh, specialized uh, interactive tools that are targeted to domain experts, right? That cannot do the programming in Python, but they can do visual query and use visual analytics to do uh, uh, very complex kinds of uh, analysis, right? And uh, you know, more recently, we're actually trying to automate data science. There's a lot of work on AutoML that you know, just given a data set and a problem, this is automatically gonna generate a complete end-to-end -end pipeline that uh, has a model to answer that or to um, answer that predictive question, right? Or you know, recommender systems uh, for visualization 
which are systems that, you know, again, you give a problem and the system is going to automatically generate visualizations uh, uh, for, for your problem, right? So, you know, I think that uh, we've made a lot of progress here and it's increasingly become, it's becoming increasingly easier for people to use computing data and generate results. We haven't solved all problems by any means. There's lots of, um, you know, uh, open uh, problems and challenges that we have to work on. But now we have a very good understanding, I think, uh, you know, of what we need to do, right? A much less uh, talked about problem is the fact that, you know, there's lots of things that can go on in, uh, can go wrong in data science. Why? Because we're doing data intensive computations, we're doing exploration. And in this, uh, and th this is an iterative process where you, you get some data, you do some computation, you get some understanding and you ask additional questions, you pose additional hypotheses, you change your computation, maybe uh, clean your data, right? And you keep doing this over and over again until you hopefully have your aha moment and you make your big discovery. The problem is that in this long chain, is this very long sequence of steps, that's very easy for you to get lost and not remember exactly how you got there. Not only that, there are many things that can go wrong. You can make mistakes. There can be a bug in your code. There can be a problem, a bug in a library that you use, right? Uh, or your computational environment. And in the end, the results that you derive can be very hard to understand, interpret, and trust. So let's look at a few examples, right? So this is a famous paper, economics paper, um, that um, actually talked about, uh, you know, countries with that over 90% of their gr gross domestic pro product, and I cannot read the rest, but essentially a paper that was published that had an incorrect conclusion. And the incorrect conclusion came about because five countries were left out from their computations, right? So this is a, you know, simple case of human error. And it was only discovered because a postdoc asked to get the spreadsheet and figured out that, uh, you know, not all cells were actually selected, right? Uh, another problem that was reported by Ars Technica was about is in chemistry. And people found that there is a bug uh, in a library, GLOB, that returns different results uh, depending on the OS. And that may actually have negatively affected hundreds of studies in chemistry, right? Uh, yet another, sorry, another example, uh, there's a system called FreeSurfer that is used to measure um, anatomical volume and cortical thickness. And the system was found to actually return different results depending on the version of the software, the hardware used or the operating system, right? And last, uh, no, actually next to last example. And here's another example of uh, data that is incorrectly used, right? So, so there's, there can be many errors or um, data quality issues with data, but in this era of big data, we are getting very good at using data for purposes that are not the purposes for which the data were collected. And this can be amazing, right? But it also uh, has some dangers. And here's one example of the danger. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with 311 data complaints. We have that in New York City and it's a great, amazing data set. And people started using that to study noise complaints, uh, noise in New York City, right? So essentially using complaints as a proxy for VO noise because we don't have good sensors everywhere around the city, right? Great, you can do a lot of things with that, but you know, a more detailed study actually found that uh, there are fewer noise complaints in areas that have a higher percentage of residents that belong to minorities, right? So by using that, you know, maybe it's not, you're not um, getting the correct picture for the areas where minority lives. Uh, minorities live, right? And there can be noise there. And what does data say that there is not, right? So there are problems here too. And uh, Last problem uh, issue is, um, I don't know if you guys have seen this paper, it's a really cool paper that came out of Berkeley a couple of years ago. Uh, and the title is, Do ImageNet Classifiers Generalize to ImageNet? And what this group did is essentially they did a, re a replication study. Uh, they built new test set for two uh, 
famous widely used data sets in machine learning, uh, ImageNet and Cypher 10. Um, so they built completely new data and they reran a number of classifiers, models that had been published in the literature. And what they found is that uh, using the, these models with the new data, they observed significant accuracy uh, drops between 3 and 15% or 11 and 14%, right? Which raises the questions about many, many uh, machine learning papers that are published in the literature. Can we really trust them, right? All right, so, you know, this can be all fine if all you're doing is, uh, you know, trying to figure out in images on the web if you see a cat or a dog, right? But when you actually use computational result as the basis for policy making or for or making decisions that impact human well being, you need reliability. Reliability has uh, be becomes more than an academic question and has real consequences, right? And this is the reason that I think. Uh, we have to go beyond democratizing the use of data science, and we need to democratize trust and robustness, right? Um, and uh, what is interesting is that I think part of this is an artifact that you know people from computer science that are doing a lot, a lot of the methodological uh, work on data science, we are very used to uh, this, uh, we develop an algorithm that we can prove is correct or we are developing code that hopefully is gonna be correct by construction, right? And when we're dealing with these um, complex systems, computational environments, or machine learning models uh, that are much more akin to natural, the natural world, right? We need to rethink of what we're doing. I think that we can learn a lot from science and how scientists actually work and follow the scientific method. Right? In particular, we need to pay attention and maybe start doing more replication studies and try to uh, quantify the uncertainty in the results that we publish. Right? And uh, essentially, we need to uh, uh, keep in mind that uh, you know, this is how science works. If you are able to repeat findings and get consistent results, you can confirm or you can view trust in that result. At, at the same time, uh, if you uh, fail to get consistent results, you should have doubts about the result that you're actually reporting, right? And for this, we need to come up with uh, new methods and strategies that uh, to systematically debug and test both data and computations that we use uh, in data science, and also explain the results that we obtain. Uh, we've, uh, we've seen some initial steps in, you know, what people are talking about explainable AI, right, where they're trying to explain the results of models, but machine learning in these models are just like one step in the huge data science pipeline, right. Uh, we need actually to be able to explain general computations, the end-to-end -end data science life cycle, right. And here's a, a, a real, like, simplified example that actually uh, got me I started in thinking about this problem more deeply. This is from a colleague at Berkeley. Uh, and for his research, he actually has to run complex workflows, multiple of them, distributed in different sites. So he has a telescope site where he runs a workflow that collects data, does some kind of processing the data. That data is sent to uh, high performance computing uh, facilities in France and at LBNL, where they do data preparation, they run simulations, and finally they get some final data that is analyzed at, uh, at bids. And they get some beautiful images like that one uh, on the right, right? And there's a feature there, something that you know, is hard to explain. And then he can ask himself, you know, is this a discovery, you know, maybe my next Nobel Prize, or is this a bug? And of course, more often than not, that's a bug. It just takes them a long time to figure out where that bug comes from, right? Sorry, the animation here, right? So the problem here is that you have all these different workflows that depend on each other. You can, you can have problems in them, you can have errors in them. Your simulation code may be buggy. Uh, you can have problems in your data. You, you know, all your code is gonna depend on this beautiful, you know, ab um, abstraction layers that 
You know, in computer science, we do we solve complexity by abstractions, right? And it's great because you know by abstracting you can do more and more complex things, right? But now your code is going to uh, depend on libraries, which depend on programming languages, which depend on operating systems, which depends on hardware. This creates a lot of dependencies uh, and potential problems that are really hard to identify and know uh, uh, know of be beforehand. So when you're trying to find the root cause for a feature in a result, it is extremely, extremely difficult. And in the case of my colleague at Berkeley, you know, these are older systems. He doesn't even have proper provenance or the ability to reproduce the actual results to track down where the problem came from, right? But in a perfect world where we can do that, where we can reproduce and repeat experiments uh, or, you know, this kind of workflows, uh, it, because we're running everything on computational environments, we can much more easily create experiments, formulate and test hypotheses. And this is what I mean. Once you have provenance and reproducibility, you're able to rerun uh, uh, your experiments. Um, you actually have the opportunity to um, use machine assisted debugging that essentially does, uh, that automates replication studies. Uh, and the way that you can do that is you can vary or perturb your data and run the process again and see what happens. You can try different parameters. You can compare different alternative methods. You can try different operating systems or different hardware and see how robust your results are to these changes. This is exactly how science works. It's just that in the natural world, it's harder. In computers, in computers we can actually do this in a more automated fashion, right? So I'd like to end with a call to action, right? The first one is, you know, let's all do reproducible research. I think we all know that that's important and we've made a lot of progress in terms of tools and environments that help you do that. Uh, but there are still many, many gaps. And if you ask any random person here, they're gonna see that try to do this, they're gonna say that they, they uh, had a number of challenges, they faced a number of challenges in doing that, right? Uh, and uh, one of the recommendations was part of this um, study group at the National Academies, and we did the study that was commissioned by NSF, and we actually uh, um, explored a number of these challenges. Uh, and uh, what is the what is a state that we? You know, how can I say? It? What it looks like right now in science? What are the challenges, and what we need to do? And one of our main recommendations was that we need more investment in infrastructure to support reproducibility. Right. What I'd like to see in my dream is that reproducibility should be a standard feature of your computational environments, where you do your experiments and they are reproducible by design and you don't have to do anything extra for that. And it's only through reproducibility and by having detailed provenance that we actually can go the next step and democratize trust and robustness for data science. And I can tell you, I've started to think about this. There's lots of very challenging and interesting open research problems there. With that, I close and thank you so much. All right, thank you. Uh, are there any questions? All right, uh, okay. I'll start nearby. So one of the things you said is that uh, there is an abundance of data, which is which I agree with, but that's a very gen generically true. You know, in many cases, when you actually try to find the data that you need, there's a severe shortage of data and data collection becomes a very important challenge in training models. So do you have any thoughts about that? So, um, so data collection, you mean sensors and so on? Yeah, so I think that, uh, it's easier for us to do right now because sensors are becoming cheaper and cheaper, right? Uh, but I think related to your question, another problem that I see a lot is that many times the data are available, you just don't know about that, right? So um, Michelle from Google was talking about that Google is starting to look at, you know, how to do what Google did for documents for data, right? Uh, and my group is also working on that. The problem is that People have data in different repositories and there's no centralized index where you can actually um, uh, 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 find them, right? So I think that yes, collection is a problem. We haven't really you know, worked a lot on that side of things, 
But uh, in the other one, which is how do we find these repositories and how we index this data so that we can better support findability, I think that that's something that, uh, you know, something can be done about. Yeah, so Jamu, yeah, go ahead. Thanks for the talk. Uh, my question is about the irreversibility, and I know it's a very important topic, but at the same time, it's, it's challenging because if people spend more time on reproducibility, they have less time to design new algorithms and new, new experiments. What do you think of the trade-off uh, between doing new research and make the existing research more reproducible? Right, so my argument is that uh, it's a lot easier right now and one of the big obstacles we have is that people don't know about the infrastructure that already is. So we need to have a lot more um, investment in education and training to inform people how to do that. It shouldn't be hard. It shouldn't really take a lot of time of you know, your research to do that, right? But as I said, I think we can do better. Still, it is some time, right? Uh, and uh, you know, I, I, as I said, I believe we can, if we invest, we can actually come up with solutions where that cost is going to tend to zero. Thank you. I just want to add one more comment is that we actually, the, from the data and infrastructure group, we have the, the breakout session this afternoon, this evening to on the computational reproducibility. So we can discuss this topic further at that breakout session. Right. Thank you. Yeah. In the back, Hi. Uh, I did have a question following up to your very interesting comment, of, uh, comment about there's a lot of data that we just don't know about it. Uh, and that's really so true. And it goes back to some of the earlier comment about metadata of data. Um, a lot of this is hidden in the domain experts' minds. If you're doing multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary work, what can we do to break through that? Because it, it's been happening year over year. Many different efforts have taken place where we try to bring in the domain experts. We try to do things together. But the real challenge is data discoverability, I think. I, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a way that we can work around that or is it just a matter of keep working with the domain experts so so i think that i can tell you more about my approach right so we, we built a system a data set search and discovery engine and what we do is once we find the data sets we instead of relying on simple descriptions that come as metadata we profile the data and we try to extract additional and semantic information, and we support more advanced queries. So not just like looking for space, time, right? But we even can find data sets that are correlated. You give me your data set, your table, uh, and you want to do a prediction, I can find data sets that can connect, can be joined, and uh, are correlated with your target variable, right? So I think that uh, there's a lot that you can we can do, and on the findability side, but you're always gonna need the domain expert because just like a search engine uh, returns you a bunch of pages and you have to decide what is relevant or not, your domain scientist will need to, you know, he, he or she is the only one that knows what is relevant, what is good or not, right? Question over here, right to your left. Okay. <laughs> um, your, your comments about uh, uh, bugs associated with different operating systems um, was particularly intriguing for me. And I was thinking a little bit about responsibility. And I was wondering if you could address the concept of responsibility um, in this context. So for example, you know, if we're publishing uh, a manuscript with, a, with a, um, a data set that's open access, and we're reporting the, the OS, the software version, are we doing enough? Um, are we being responsible enough? Are we really liable for doing more for testing uh, with different OSs? With really, I mean, because this is tricky, right? Uh, if if there become problems with your data analysis, but not necessarily your data set, mm -hmm. how do you how do you uh, where where do you put responsibility in this context? Right. So I think that's your responsibility if you're publishing your data, your code that actually enables others to run your work again and do and repeat what you did. I think that is already a, a big first step because you know we are dealing with these very complex environments and many things can go wrong. And I don't think there is a hope for you to test everything, right? There is space for say automated tools that will do, you know, let's run your work on different OSs or you know, different hardware and so on. Some of that we can automate and maybe in the future 
it's going to be easier to do that, right? Uh, but right now, by publishing uh, work that is reproducible, as others use your work, right? And this is what science does. It's like a replication. They use your work. They vary things. New things can be discovered, right? And that is also how science progresses. So I think that, you know, we, we, we don't have the time and we don't have the resources to do everything. For what matters, though? Right, if something actually, um, how can I say, directly impact your results, those you should work really, really hard. If you have a machine learning model and you're saying, oh, this is actually really good. If you try on a single data set, I'm sorry, that's not enough, right? Um, I, I just wanna follow up. I think it was the IHOP rep representative that made the point about a trade-off between reproducibility and extensibility. And this also touches on something very important in Michelle's talk. Um, and I, I've worked in this space on reproducibility for a while. I, we had an NSF grant called DASBUS. And as I've thought more about this, I mean, I think both the, the reproducibility is critical, but it, it can some, it, it, there's another aspect to it, uh, which is really the extensibility that maybe gets overshadowed by the reproducibility. Let me quickly say, so like the containers are a perfect way to reproduce a result. You basically are packaging up the whole OS and the whole environment. And you can just, and, that, and reproducible is extremely important in terms of, establishing and maintaining our credibility with our with our investors in our science as the in the public at large so yes but i think the the part that gets overshadowed a bit which i i find um is is the uh, extensibility we want to take it's more of a forward looking part we want to be able to take what we've done and give to a new student or a student in another group or somebody else some other researcher to carry the the the, the developments forward Reproducibility is really about making sure we can reproduce results that are like, it's a little bit past, which is important versus future. So my question is, um, I just wanna make that point and maybe have you thought about uh, uh, the emphasis on, there's also a very sort of uh, uh, enabling element in terms of uh, being able to engage with a broader set of broader community than we usually work with, like to be able to give a student analysis and be able to then take, carry it forward is really enabling and it also helps democratize access to our science. So I, I just wanted to know if you um, had thoughts about the reproduce, your, your talk was very reproducibility focused, but how does that relate to maybe the extensibility? For example, containers are not very good to extend an analysis. You pull them apart and you can't, a student can't figure out how to pull the pieces forward. So it's not very good for extensibility, but it's very good for reproducibility. Right. So I just wanna know your thoughts on no, that. No, no. So I think this is, this is a very important point, right? Uh, one issue that we hear, have here is terminology because uh, different concepts are conflated in terms. So yes, yeah, I talked about reproducibility and if you look at the NAS report, we try to make a distinction between reproducibility, replicability. Reproducibility means you do exactly what you did before. Replicability, you actually vary things, right? And um, extensibility is necessary for replicability. So this is what was in between the lines there, right? And I, I do mean that you should be able to um, do extensibility because you know ideally we'd like to try different things. We'd like to try different methods. So you need to change what you have there. You need to try different operating systems. So what is in the container is not going to work, right? So excellent point. Yes, so I, I, I yeah. Exactly right, right. And 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 there is also like different cultural, um, how can I say, um, norms. So even within computer science, in computer science, we have a number of uh, um, efforts where we evaluate papers or results of papers, their, rep their reproducibility. In some communities, they just do the reproducibility and try to rerun everything. If you go to SIGGRAPH, the graphics folks, you need to send a make file because it goes from the compilation to everything else, right? But this is, this is as critical and as, you know, people that work on methods, extensibility is very, very important for us. All right, we have a question. I'm, I'm wondering what the, and, and maybe in the, it's in the National Academy report, um, and I'm wondering if the National Academy looked at the role of libraries in this picture, so in terms of indexing data sets. So, I'm thinking of an analogy, libraries contain their own collection of books or their own collection of data but they also have indexes that connect to other libraries where other data sets may exist. So um, I feel like, you know, there's some 
potentially some reinvention of the search engine problem, but I'm wondering what if there's an analogy with libraries and data sets and findability and indexing here that that the National Academies has looked at. Uh, so, so the National Academies didn't really work, uh, look into the problem of, um, of you know, findability or indexing, right? But your analogy is dead on. I think that, you know, all this work on data set search and so on, this model of having distributed collections, that's the only way to do it because it's not feasible to do it otherwise. Right? Last question for Xiaowen. Yeah, uh, Xiaomen Wang from University of Illinois. A really great talk. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. The question I'm asking is from a different perspective. That's uh, access to data, which is a big part of democratization and reproducibility, especially from industry side. We know they hold a lot of data. So I was wondering whether you have any insights, advice with regard to how we as a community work with the industry to get a better access to the data they own. That's a very difficult question. Uh, I don't know how to do that at scale. I mean, we've had collaborations with industry where we got data, you know, from them. There have been a number of uh, initiatives from, um, I think, Twitter, uh, Uber, and so on to share data. But usually they start with a big, you know, uh, and then they die down. Uh, maybe that's something that, uh, you know, we in this community could actually get together and try to come up with a more systematic or maybe proposals to make this happen, right? Yeah, uh, because usually small groups do not have the institutional power to, to work it. with these big elephants. Yeah. But this is a pretty sizable data science community. If we could figure out a framework, right, to engage exactly. these big elephants, that might be an opportunity for that us. That may to be an option. Yeah, and, more greatly. yeah, and this is one of the reasons that much of my research. My, much of my research, I use all open data simply because, you know, it's, I avoid all those hoops. <laughs> thank you. All right, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. All right, uh, so now we're gonna start the research panel, or sorry, the, and the, the, the research panel session. Um, this will start with a talk um, from Adam Smith uh, from BU. Uh, on responsible AI. Um, and then we'll have uh, several panel members who will be up here and uh, they will give a brief, inter giant brief introduction and then we'll take questions uh, from the audience and have a discussion. So um, without further ado, I think we have the... My clicker, right? Yes. Yeah, so. yeah. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Indico, but the slides.